Thank you very much, Jaydev. It's an honor to be here. Uh, this is my 32nd Ikra. How many of you are born <laughs> that far back? Uh, this has been one conference that I've attended for the last 32 years. It's just really been a remarkable ride. I'm, I'm very, I'm grateful for, I don't know what led to the series of events that led me to say, I'm going to work in robotics. It's really paid off after all these years. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here to try tell you a little bit about the work we do in, uh, in micro aerial vehicles. Um, I want to start first, though, by acknowledging uh, many, many federal funding agencies in the U.S. that support my work, uh, our work, uh, particularly the Army Research Laboratory and DARPA, uh, which is most related to the work that I'm going to be talking about. Um, and also from industry, we, we have uh, good collaborations with Qualcomm and NVIDIA that I'll also speak about. Um, I've also had the pleasure of seeing many spin-off companies coming out of our lab. Um, KML Robotics, which is acquired by Qualcomm. I'll say a little bit about Trifo. Um, which works on applications to agriculture, identify technologies, which is now based in uh, Pittsburgh. They do aerial mapping. Exxon Technologies, a company that I founded, which, and I'll say a little bit about this, they do work in uh, mining. Uh, and then finally, I work with a nonprofit called We Robotics, which is doing remarkable work in the area of global health and uh, disaster response. I'll say a little bit about that. Um, but first, I want to start with a uh, brief history of aerial robotics. I don't know how many of you know this, but uh, it's really remarkable that the first uh, international aerial robotics competition happened in 1991 when we didn't know how to build uh, aerial robots. Um, and just to show you an example of some of the work we did before 2000, um, and I can't show you videos because none of these robots really took off. Um, so I don't have, I mean, I have some really embarrassing videos. But uh, motors were underpowered. Uh, we didn't know how to build the electronics for stabilization. And somehow, so in the left, you see a quad rotor. On the right, we said, oh, we're going to put more motors. And we had this eight octorotor omnidirectional vehicle, which did take off, but it always had a, uh, a bed of a red and white, a red and blue balloons to land on in case it crashed, and it inevitably crashed many times. And uh, just to remind you, these ideas are not novel. Um, as I'm fond of saying, there are no new ideas, only good ideas. Uh, the early quad rotors go back to uh, 1907, the gyroplane, and uh, there's some debate as to the, 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 these two French uh, bicycle mechanicians who made air aircrafts, rotorcrafts fly in 1907, uh, but the modern day quad rotor design, I think, traces back to 1922, and of course, there are these flying windmill designs for air power, which, uh, which wind power that were, um, uh, were um, uh, and proposed at least in 2007. I don't know if any of these are really practical, but a great article in Wired magazine if you really want to go back and look at this history. Um, but going back to this, so uh, I think for 15 or so years, this was really, really hard. Um, and then we have to think about what really made aerial robots feasible. And, and it's something that we don't think enough about. Really, it's about inertial measurement units, IMUs. Um, Accelerometers became popular thanks to cars, uh, first airbags, then electronic stability control. And then really the inflection point for aerial robotics came with the three axis accelerometers. So if it wasn't for all those kids playing Nintendo games, and then of course for the Apple iPhone, uh, we would not have had today's uh, lightweight indoor quad rotors. So it's something that is worth looking at. Um, and uh, I think around 2008, 2009, I think small multi-rotor aircrafts became very practical all of a sudden. Um, uh, Ascending Technologies, one of the earliest companies to make uh, commercial prototypes available. Uh, KML Robotics, our spin-off, this shows a hex rotor, but uh, really Daniel Mellinger and Alex Kushliev in our lab uh, did a lot of the early work uh, in 2009, which we we tried to put together in a report which appeared in the Robotics and Op Automation magazine. Um, but in 2009, it was still really hard to do uh, perception on board. Um, and I just want to show you an early video from our lab where uh, essentially we used the early, an early model of cl uh, cloud robotics where the feedback loop was really cl closed in the cloud. We had off-board motion capture camera systems and then on-board IMUs providing feedback. But really the computation was done on off-board servers and then on-board microcontrollers for computing. And these are nonlinear controllers that run on-board uh, the quad rotor at 100 times, 100 times a second. And so all of these um, maneuvers uh, involved planning. I'll say a little bit about that. 
Uh, but, the, but the real thing, that was the, the really hard thing here was the perception which essentially we ignored because we had perfect state inst estimation coming from off-board computers, off-board uh, cameras. Um, so the key idea here was to uh, recognize that uh, quad rotors have this property of differential flatness um, and you can plan trajectories using that property uh, and essentially all our planners reduce the planning problem to a quadratic programming problem. So here Daniel is showing how you can minimize uh, uh, a functional which has to do with snap, the fourth degree of position, and even though the environment changes, if you have perfect feedback information f uh, fr from the motion capture camera systems about moving obstacles, you can actually plan trajectories in real time. So 40 times a second, you're solving this uh, quadratic program to find uh, a trajectory that is feasible. Um, and a couple of years later, uh, again, uh, they were able to miniaturize it to 75 gram quad rotors, and these were sort of the early swarms in uh, 2011. And even unlike today's modern day uh, uh, demonstrations by Intel and others, uh, though which was choreographed here, the idea was that you have a combination of onboard and offboard computing, um, and you try to adapt the formation to the, uh, to the environment. Um, so this was novel at that time, and this is uh, end of 2011, early 2012. And just three years later, uh, drones were everywhere. Uh, they entered your family room, they entered your living room. Um, and I'm, I'm reminded that in the December of 2015, I think DJI show, uh, sold a million drones just in the US alone. Um, so it, was, it, it, it really took everybody by, by storm. Um, and uh, drone racing became a thing. This is a, uh, one of our uh, PhD students, Yash Mulgankar, who will soon be defending. Um, happens to be an expert pilot. He placed 10th in the drone nationals in New York City. And here you could see just remarkable agility coming from a high thrust to weight ratio uh, motors and a lot of onboard electronics. Of course, all the intelligence is in Yash's head and through the first person view, he's able to navigate these obstacles. Um, and so nobody anticipated this even four years uh, uh, ago. And now we've gone beyond, beyond quad rotors. You, you see these morphing designs that recently came out from uh, Floriano and Scaramuzza's group. Uh, these very cool triangular uh, quad rotors from Paul Pound's group. And then David Saldana yesterday uh, presented work where uh, you have these modular quad rotors docking in midair and forming complex structures, a collaboration between uh, Mark Yim's group uh, and my group. Um, so uh, a lot of interest here. I'm, I'm, I want to remind you that uh, there's been about a couple of billion dollars uh, poured into uh, quad rotor-based platforms and startups, and it's it's. Uh, worth looking at the hype that surrounds all this investment. Again, those of you who are not familiar with this hype cycle, um, on the left side is the innovation trigger, which usually happens when academics like us have really smart ideas and we think we can push this technology further. And in the middle, you have this hype, which is the peak of inflated ex expectations, which is really uh, uh, the marketing piece where uh, people hype up the technology. And of course, it come, and we're responsible partially for it, but also uh, uh, venture capitalists push it up. And, uh, and then this trough of uh, disillusionment where inevitably most new technologies will come down that before they stabilize and so on. So this is 2017, just two years after everybody thought quadros are going to be everywhere. Um, and you see there are actually the commercial UAV drones which are just coming down the hype cycle. And so when I looked at it, I said, this is good. Uh, the hype is dying down. But what was remarkable in 2018, they're nowhere. They went down. Uh, the trough of disillusionment and then went off the plateau of productivity and just disappeared totally. Except they came back. Autonomous flying cars. And this is amazing, right? So we're able to take, if one technology slides off because it's too difficult, we take that technology and take another technology, both of which are equally hard, we combine it together and that, become, that goes up the hype cycle. So we'll have autonomous flying cars someday. Um, and it's interesting, by the way, the one invariant in all of these, of course, if you look at the peak is deep learning and deep learning has stayed on the top of the, uh, of, of the, of the hype cycle for two consecutive years. We'll see what happens next year. Um, so 10 years later, after this inflection point, um, Goldman Sachs, I think, accurately believes this is a $100 billion market. Um, 
And to me, 70% of this is totally uninteresting. This is where the military dominates. Um, and then the 17% is a consumer industry. So I think it's dominated by companies like DJI, uh, Skydio, uh, many other companies. The real interesting thing to me is really in the business to business sector, uh, where I think there are huge applications in agriculture, mining, health, um, and other kinds of industries, construction industry, for example. But really, it's a time for reckoning for, for most of us with all this hype. And by the way, I say aerial robotics. We're just getting started. A lot of interesting potential. But I could take out the word aerial and it would apply to robotics as well. So with all the hype in AI and robotics, it's, it's really, really tricky to be a university researcher and to chart a path for our research. Um, on one hand, a lot of promise. Uh, on the other hand, it really is futile to com compete with industry. So you have one smart PhD student, industry will have 10 smart PhDs. And, and I think it's not fair on your PhD student to sort of say, okay, you solve this hard problem. Um, the other thing that's somewhat unfair is, I mean, the world is very asymmetric. What happens in industry stays in industry. And I think, uh, on the other hand, as academics, everything that we do is, is open source, it's published. Um, so it's, an un un it's not a level playing field, I, I feel. Um, but on the other hand, uh, we, we have this uh, opportunity, which is uh, from thanks to industry, a lot of the price to performance ratio of many, many uh, component technologies is coming down. Um, and you can ask, uh, where do you want to be? And so in, in, in our group, we've sort of decided to, to uh, move the bar 10 years out and to focus on five attributes of, uh, of flying vehicles. We want to make them smaller. Most things you see in industry are bigger for outdoor operations. We want to be small. We want to operate indoors. We want to keep these safe. Uh, we want to make them smart so that they can recognize people. They can recognize the environment. They can take intelligent actions. We want to focus on speed because I do believe small aerial vehicles will have a future in emergency response and they need to react quickly to disasters. And then finally, as you scale things down, you're inevitably uh, driven into this world of vehicles talking to each other, network machines, network people, and I think swarms are going to get really important. So that's where we want to go. And there's an inherent contradiction in some of these attributes. Um, in particular, the, the notion of making things smaller and smarter. Um, and I'll just show you some empirical evidence to, to illustrate that uh, contradiction. So you take uh, vehicles, and again, uh, being uh, somewhat self-centered, these are vehicles we've built in our lab, uh, the 20 grams on the left side, all the way up to 3.5 kilos. Um, and you'll see that as you make vehicles bigger, the rotors are bigger, batteries are bigger, you can carry more things. So there's more compute, there's more sensing, um, and therefore you get more autonomy. Um, and this is not a battle that you'll ever win if you go down this route. Um, on the other hand, you can take some inspiration from what is available in the consumer electronics industry. So if you look in 2015, you'll see this uh, uh, Samsung smartphone stuck on a, on a drone, a $99 drone. And uh, you can think about putting all the compute and, uh, on that uh, smartphone and then using the onboard cameras and IMUs to essentially drive that vehicle. So one opportunity is really to figure out what we can do with existing products, existing component technologies, and think about more clever algorithms. Uh, the other one is to think about the hardware that goes on board and think about the heavy components of the, uh, the, the, uh, of the technology, mostly coming from LIDARs, and think about how you can migrate that over to, to cameras. So in our lab, we try to do both, um, and in particular, uh, when you go at high speeds, uh, this, this trade-off is important. So this is the Falcon, uh, which many of uh, my students, along with, uh, with C.J. Taylor, a colleague in our lab, um, have been working on. So this vehicle operates at high speeds. You see it navigating 20 meters per second. The only sensors on board are two cameras uh, and an IMU. And again, imagine operating in environments like this. You want to be small. You want to react quickly. This is uh, after an earthquake, for example. And, and, and you, you, you really want to, you, you can't afford to move slowly in these kinds of settings. Um, is there a clock here? No. Thank you. I'll have my phone here. 
Um, so let me say a little bit about some of the challenges we try to address in the lab. Um, and these are not challenges that are unique to aerial robotics, but they are unique when you think of it in the context of small, lightweight platforms. I mean, the first challenge, of course, is state estimation. I'll say a little bit about that. Then how to build perception action loops that can react, that can function in real time for autonomy. How do you navigate in cluttered environments? And then when you think about swarms, it's not just about closing the feedback loop around perception with perception action. You also want to think of communication in the same, in the same breath. Um, so first, uh, just a few comments about perception action loops. So, so this is what we know how to do today. This is what has been commoditized, and this is what I can tell you works, and it actually does work. There's open source code for this. There's papers describing this. The basic idea of being able to take a, a multi-rotor vehicle and designing nonlinear controllers that operate almost everywhere on the Euclidean group, and there's, there's, there's sort of there's theoretical justifications for it. There's practical empirical verification. Um, and this actually was developed by the robotics community, not by the aerospace engineering community, although they've been working with aggressive, aggressively maneuvering aircraft for a longer time. Um, so this works. The idea that you plan trajectories, and I'm not going to describe the details, the idea that you can actually have controllers that follow these tra uh, trajectories very faithfully. So what becomes harder uh, is to go from this level up the software stack, since Unlike in many other robotic applications, when things happen very, very quickly, you want to think of the system at a higher level, and you want to abstract out the basic ideas of that system and design something at a higher level that operates at a slightly lower uh, uh, rate, uh, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a less fine time scale, at a coarser time scale. And in, inevitably, you're driven into this world where the symbolic commands interacting with a continuous system. And so you really have to think about the semantics of the environment you're in and uh, figuring out how to control something that, that moves really quickly through a dynamic environment. And then eventually, you would like to abstract this out even further and think about doing this at a completely discrete level. So uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't have a principled way of doing this. We know how to build feedback loops. We don't know how to nest feedback loops in the traditional sense of you know, software encapsulation. Uh, uh, we, we really don't know how to do this. Um, and yet, we have to go from this continuous world to this completely discrete world. And once again, for, small, for slowly moving vehicles, this, it's very, they're very forgiving. But for fast moving vehicles, it's, it's actually very hard to do. Um, and becomes a little more complicated, and this is uh, more recent work that uh, uh, Jimmy Paulos, Kate Tolstaya, Daigo, and uh, Arbas are doing with colleagues, actually George is in the audience, George Pappas, and also Alejandro Ribeiro. How do you actually put uh, these nested feedback loops together in multiple vehicles? In much of the work we do, uh, uh, machine learning doesn't play a prominent role. It only plays a prominent role in terms of tuning feedback loops and in terms of perception. Uh, but for the first time, we're actually looking at how to communicate across vehicles and this business of tr uh, understanding which vehicle needs to talk and to whom and what it needs to say across these time scales is a, is a tricky uh, problem. And there are no formal models for doing this except for very trivial models of swarming, which are based on nearest neighbor communication. So how to do this in a principled way um, is, 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 at this point at least, it eludes our understanding. Uh, but on the other hand, you can, you can think about a variety of ways of training feedback loops using machine learning algorithms. The, the second uh, challenge, and, and once again, uh, state estimation is an old problem. But, uh, and visual geometry has, has matured over the years. There's excellent work by Stefano Serrato, Sturgis Romulotis, uh, Xiao Ji Shen, my, my former student, uh, and Davide Skaramutsa. Uh, but how to put a package together on a fast-moving vehicle that, in, that experience a variety of changes in the environment in terms of illumination conditions, um, in terms of uh, 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 sudden changes from uh, bright environments to dark environments, for example. Um, how to do this in a reliable way is quite tricky. And so this is work by Kurt and Kartik Mota. And uh, once again, this is not stuff that's under the hood. It's available open source. Uh, and the best solution we've found uh, from a theoretical standpoint, also from an experimental standpoint, is something that combines this uh, stereo and an IMU. 
Um, so the model is, is quite straightforward. This is explained very nicely um, in uh, Sturgeo's multi-state uh, constrained common filter uh, paper. But this is, a, so the orientation, the, the gyro bias, the velocity, the acceleration bias, the position, and then the extrinsics. And of course, you augment the state because you're looking at multiple points. Um, and then you use stereo camera measurements and you wrap everything else into a common filter-like uh, setting. Um, so the nice thing uh, about this, and so we call it the stereo multi-state constrained common filter, um, it, it's a tightly coupled approach and it's uh, better than all approaches we've looked at in terms of consistency and accuracy. So this inherits the properties of the original um, multi-state uh, constrained common filter, but also inherits the property of robustness because you have uh, a, a stereo camera that gives you consistently scale in a variety of conditions. And so you could see even in um, uh, feature impoverished environments like this runway that you see, we, we achieve top speeds of 18 meters per second. Uh, and then a fairly complex environment in the bottom right, I'll show you a video of this, uh, over uh, a fairly uh, extended travel, 700 meters, uh, uh, in forests, in, in, uh, in open fields, in parking lots, inside buildings. Uh, we do a pretty good job with this uh, system. And of course, if you have other sensors, which you don't in lightweight platforms, but in heavier platforms you do, then there's a way to sort of pull things around. And this goes back to work that Xiao Ji Shen did. He's now at Hong Kong uh, University of Science and Technology, which ties in laser scanners, altimeters, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so uh, this is great. Uh, but if you want to use it now for autonomy, you kind of want to build a local map. And so this local map is important uh, because you're moving really fast, and you want to uh, discriminate between uh, obstacles, occupied space, and then free space. And once again, the emphasis is on speed, so that's why you only need a local horizon. Of course, if you really wanted to, you could store all the data um, and then build more complex uh, maps. But here, the goal is to drive our planner, uh, again, this quadratic program that then eventually uh, allows the robot to follow a feasible trajectory. Um, and we don't really worry about doing SLAM in these kinds of fast-moving settings. So just to show you the, one of the platforms we use, again, designed by Yash Mulgankar, um, this is our DARPA Fast Lightweight Autonomy Platform, the FLA, and, and, and for, for called, the program called FLA. Uh, how, has onboard cameras and an IMU and then a LiDAR. In this particular case, it's a 2D LiDAR, but it nods. Um, so you essentially get a, a somewhat 3D scan. Um, so if you have a cluttered environment, uh, how do you plan? Well, fundamentally, uh, if, you, if you think about uh, having uh, this property of differential flatness, you can essentially think about a quadratic program, um, and the functional j is a function of snap, the fourth derivative position. And then the factor rho essentially weights time. So you can ignore smoothness, uh, focus on time, but the dynamics are basically linear. So what makes this problem complicated um, is essentially the configuration space. And so this is work by Sekang Lu, Mike Watterson, Sarah Tang, and uh, Subrajit Bhattacharya, who's at, uh, who's at Lehigh. Um, the, what makes this complicated? Well, firstly, it's a high dimensional system. It's a relative degree of four, to be precise. It's non-convex, so, which means you have to reason about trajectories that go one way around the obstacle versus another way. Um, and uh, finally, and this is a tricky thing, is that it, the environment is never fully known. You only know the environment based on the sensors you're operating in. Um, so let me show you an algorithm that uh, is in this video, and again, the simulation illustrates this. Essentially, the, f the free space has been uh, uh, abstracted by a union of convex sets, each set being an ellipsoid. And essentially, the problem of finding a feasible trajectory inside the set of union of convex sets is a, is a quadratic program, which is something you can solve in real time in a predictable way. Um, and so this method we've be, been able to use from five meters, five meters per second to about 20 meters per second. This is uh, right outside our lab. Um, and, and you could see it avoiding trees um, using exactly the same uh, algorithm. Um, Another approach, uh, which is also very promising, is again by uh, Sekang Lu and, and, and Nikolai, a former postdoc who is now at UCSD. Um, and this is the idea of uh, reducing this high dimensional planning problem to a graph search problem. So if you take this uh, snap functional, um, you can generate these minimum snap motion primitives, and I show some examples of that. 
And then you can think about uh, the lattice structure that these motion primitives induce and think about searching uh, that graph uh, using a variety of graph search algorithms which, uh, which Max Lip Likachev uh, introduced uh, into our group uh, a few years ago when he was at Penn. Um, and uh, you can not only search this efficiently if you use heuristics uh, based on dynamics, uh, but more importantly, you can also do um, non-trivial things, like for example, if you look on the right-hand panel, if you look at uh, the shortest distance path for a kinematic vehicle, uh, which is obviously feasible if you go really, really slow, um, and if you look at the bottom right, you will see something that uses the minimum cost functional corresponding to, uh, to snap, and you will see that the logical way for the vehicle to travel at high speeds is to take the longer path, uh, but have a smoother path and a, and a shorter time to go. So these things can be naturally woven into uh, the graph search algorithm. So this has a nice property that it's resolution com complete. So we're doing all these computations on a new i7, uh, an Intel processor. Uh, but uh, the limited field of view really creates some challenges. So this cartoon illustrates some of those challenges. So imagine you have a map M, and you are at PK at time T sub K. You want to go to the goal. So this method will find you, or any method, will find you a feasible trajectory. But uh, you're tra imagine you're traveling at 20 meters per second, and the goal is outside the area that you can see, the area that you modeled. And so do some simple math. So 20 meters per second, imagine you can stop at 1G. Uh, the stopping time is about two seconds, and the stopping distance is about 20 meters. So imagine you're carrying a sensor that can't see beyond 20 meters. Uh, you really have to plan for the unlikely but probable event that at the end of that horizon is a brick wall. Um, and so you have to figure out what trajectories are feasible so that you actually can negotiate this unexpected obstacle at the end of your horizon. Um, so what we do essentially is plan a step which comes with an insurance policy, a safety certificate. So not only do we plan this, the trajectory from TK to TK plus one, uh, but we also plan a stopping policy, psi sub K, which takes us to a safe state G prime, where G prime is a trivial state. You come to stop at that state. So every time you pick a policy, you only pick a policy that also is accompanied by the safety certificate. And this gives you the property of not only being resolution complete, uh, but it's also safe. So let me show you a video that illustrates this. So in this video, on the bottom left, you see the, what the robot knows, which is basically nothing. Um, on the right side, uh, you see what the robot has been told. It's been told to go to this destination uh, which is uh, roughly 350 meters away uh, in a particular direction. It does not know anything about the environment. And on the top left, you see what the robot actually sees. Um, so you'll see the robot take off. And as soon as it takes off, you'll see the map being populated on the bottom left. On the right side, this is a post-processing where we overlay the map in terms of what the robot has seen on a Google Earth image. And again, remember, it knows nothing about the building. It knows nothing about the trees. And it travels at a, at a speed of about five meters per second as it goes through uh, this forest. Um, and uh, all the state estimation is done without GPS, with the stereo camera pair with the algorithm I, I told you about. Um, and I'm going to fast forward, fast forward this in a minute. This is in uh, real time. And I'm going to skip ahead to the point where it gets to the building. Uh, when it gets to the building, um, it realizes it's in front of a building. It needs to find uh, this, the, go to this spot where, the, where this asterisk is. Um, and by the way, it's looking for an object that's been designated by DARPA. It happens to be a red barrel. Um, you'll see it now desperately trying to get into that building, although it doesn't yet know the semantics of a building. So essentially, it's trying to find the shortest distance uh, to uh, to that goal, uh, again, shortest distance, shortest cost in, in a dynamic sense. It'll turn the corner, and you'll see the sudden change in illumination from that bright outdoor Florida sun to the dimly lit indoors, and a whole bunch of obstacles placed courtesy of DARPA, which we had no knowledge about, 
I know Dave Barron is in the audience. He's probably responsible for some of these obstacles. And it turns the corner, and uh, there's the red barrel. Um, and it'll take a minute to identify it. It turns around, it says, I found the red barrel, and then it goes back to base and reports, hey, I found this red bar barrel at this, at, this, at this particular location. Now, obviously, in the real world, we're not interested in red barrels. We're interested in objects of interest, perhaps human victims. Um, but all of this needs to happen without any uh, human control and without the presence of GPS and certainly without remote uh, control of any kind. Um, and you could see it go back to base. So this is great, but all the obstacle avoidance here was done uh, with, a, with a laser finder, with, with a laser scanner. Um, so as we move to smaller, lighter, faster, and safer, we've started, we've gone now from um, LiDAR-based platforms to camera-only platforms. And uh, this is more recent work uh, led by, uh, in, in, along with other people, uh, also Shreya Shivkumar and my colleague CJ Taylor. So this is a camera-only solution. You can see the speeds are more modest at about one meter per second, which is roughly half walking speed, strolling speed for many of us. Um, and it go going into this collapsed building, again, a building it's never seen before. Um, you see the first person view, what the robot sees, again, no human control. Um, and it's able to navigate uh, through this building. Um, and in this case, it collects pieces of information, not yet processing uh, what it sees in real time. Um, in the sense that it doesn't understand what it's seen, it doesn't understand the semantics of the environment. But that's because the compute on board is still uh, somewhat limited. So we use here um, uh, a camera system developed by Open Source uh, Robotics Foundation in collaboration with us, um, uh, along with uh, a TX and NVIDIA TX2. Um, and you can see the map that it's, it creates, uh, but more importantly, it's navigating to completely unstructured environments that it has never seen before. And now, continuing this trajectory onto smaller uh, vehicles, uh, we have also, in collaboration with Qualcomm, developed a 250-gram uh, quad-order reference platform. So this is, this is powered by uh, Qualtra, uh, Qualcomm Snap, Snapdragon Flight Board, um, which again comes from all the smartphone development uh, technology, um, has a 160 degree field of view downward facing camera that allows it to do visual odometry. Also a forward facing uh, camera pair synced with an IMU, um, onboard DSP for, con uh, for control, uh, CPU and GPU. So this is just showing Aaron Weinstein and Giuseppe Loyana's work where they essentially prescribe shapes and the robots figure out how to occupy different shapes in the formation, um, deciding who goes where and when. Works indoors, works outdoors, uh, as you'll see in a minute, also works in fairly low illumination environments um, when I show you this video of uh, the robots functioning in a, in a parking lot. Um, so the really nice thing about this is, again, uh, in some sense, as a community, we've helped uh, subsidize the development of all of this because everybody wants to have more powerful smartphones with better cameras that are lightweight and low power. And we're basically riding the per price performance curve uh, for uh, consumer electronics. Um, uh, so uh, the thing we haven't used on board, of course, is, uh, is, the, is, the, um, uh, uh, is the, uh, the cell communication. Um, in most of this, the communication happens with Wi-Fi, but once you also enable cell, uh, you eliminate the need for any kind of um, uh, base infrastructure, um, which, is, which is pretty nice. Um, so this is the low, low illumination environment, again, in a parking lot illuminated by a pair of headlamps from a car. So the really cool thing now is that we're uh, taking uh, this particular robot and uh, a modified version of this is, will soon be deployed in, uh, in, a, in a reactor unit in Fukushima. Um, uh, so Daniela, this is our family picture. I don't know if you recognize the picture in the middle. Uh, so the person in front is me. That's in, in building number five. And the person behind me is Daniela, and then Gil Pratt is, uh, is behind her. Uh, but we, this was one of the most amazing tours that I've been on. Uh, of course, the fact that uh, I picked up enough radiation to last me a year was not lost on my wife. Uh, but, uh, but it really gave uh, all of us a sense of where robotics can truly have an impact. And now, um, and this is a project led by Dinesh uh, and Giuseppe is involved, uh, Laura Lipschitz, Wen Shin Liu, and Elijah Lee. Um, we're actually testing these vehicles, and soon we hope to test it um, in um, 
unit number one, first unit number five, yet in unit number one. So on the top right, you see all the state estimation and planning working in smoky environments. Um, the bottom left, it has to carry its own uh, lighting because there's no light inside. Uh, and of course, we don't know what to expect. We expect uh, water to be dripping. Uh, and so you could see in the center panel um, uh, with collaborators from SWRI, they've actually waterproofed this platform. Also done a lot of radiation testing to make sure the platform actually works. The one thing that we know will not work is the comms lengths or RF immediately breaks in an in a, uh, environment with radiation. And you could see on the right side, this is real-time planning software, all based on the stereo camera, reconstructing the environment. Uh, again, moving at a very, very modest speed. We want this to last about five minutes to get us the data, and then after that, it'll probably be buried inside the reactor. But right now, nobody, nobody knows what's in the building. Um, Finally, uh, I want to say a little bit about uh, the environment I've grown up in since the last ICRA, which is the GRASP Laboratory. We're celebrating our 40th anniversary. Just a great group of colleagues, um, and we, we expect to bring three new roboticists on board uh, soon. Um, this is a new building we've built, and one of the nice things about this building, um, so my group, Mark Yim's group, Dan Kodacek's group is on the third floor. The first floor and the second floor are full of startups, uh, many coming out of uh, our, our own uh, technologies and just a great environment where researchers can in interact with those that develop technology and mature the technology. Um, about 13 uh, robotic spin-offs have come out of this and many of them have moved out. Uh, one in particular, if I can talk about, is Exxon Technologies, the one that I've been most uh, closely involved. All the names in red are all connected to this community. Um, they've all worked with me at one point or the other, either as postdocs or PhD students. Um, so what Exxon does uh, is develop platforms for mining. So you can see this, it's a completely autonomous operation of, uh, in a gold mine in Bulgaria uh, run, run by Dundee, operated by Dundee Precious Metals. A spinning LIDAR allows it to navigate this incredibly complex 3D environment. Uh, again, very hard to develop maps up front. Nominal trajectories are shown here, and the robot basically figures out how to navigate this 30-meter stope, uh, build this three-dimensional map, um, again, no opportunity for visual line of sight, no opportunity for comms, which means it has to be completely um, uh, autonomous. Um, so at the end of the day, you have these very uh, uh, rich three-dimensional maps, uh, which you can create either with some planning, or as you'll see in a minute, you can also create by exploration. So this is an assault mine where a lot of the techniques that uh, we've sort of seen in the robotics literature are now being used by a company uh, with the kind of 24-7 reliability that you expect in machines. Um, and so here it is navigating this mine and, and just building a very nice uh, map. And again, from a mining standpoint, this is, this is incredible because you're essentially um, able to reduce the cost for mining, uh, reduce delays, and minimize risk to human life. Um, and so what works in mines also works in transit stations. This is actually Philadelphia's uh, Transit Authority SEPTA, um, and they're very interested in this idea of having uh, drones. And look, look at the imagery that comes from this. Imagine trying to do uh, state estimation using onboard LIDARs and cameras, which is something that Exxon uh, has, has, has perfected. Justin Thomas, I know, is in the audience. He's somebody who can answer all these questions. But able to navigate these very complex environments and build maps like this, uh, not just for inspection and monitoring, but also uh, from, from the standpoint of uh, fighting terrorism. Um, you know, this is an important tool uh, that, that uh, we, we will have um, in terms of going, uh, reacting to, to disasters. Um, uh, finally, if I can talk one more application, uh, we're working on precision farming, where our goal is to sort of think about uh, how to actually estimate the yield of farms. Um, in particular, count fruits, trees, measure plant stress, um, work that's being led by Stephen Chen, who's, who's here, and Shreyas is also here. But first, we have uh, a, um, uh, a crowdsourcing platform called label.ag that allows us to, to label fruits, which, uh, as I've learned over the years, is much, much harder to do than it's, it sounds. Um, it's actually really hard to count trees in a, in a, in a, in a plant. Uh, sorry, fruits in a plant. So if you, if you go to an orange tree, a uh, mango tree, try to count the number of fruits, and chances are you'll be off by about 50%. So with the techniques, and I don't have time to describe this, 
uh, we're actually able to get to uh, accuracies that are comparable to what humans can do in very, very small windows. So if I show you three fruits, chances are you'll get it right 100% of the time. So we want to get to that kind of an accuracy. Um, and of course, we already know how to navigate uh, forests, uh, for example, go through trees. So rather than look at things from the top, which of course industry is already doing, lots of companies trying to do that, what we're trying to do is to get views from the side and understand the semantics of what we're looking at. Um, and so we do this using a combination of cameras and lidars, as you can see on the left side. Uh, we detect objects, um, mostly fruits and, uh, and trees, and then we track them from frame to frame. And if you can track objects of interest from frame to frame and you get semantic information, that also allows you to get information that allows you to build better maps. So our SLAM actually is enabled by the semantic information. Um, and you could see the three-dimensional maps that we, we build uh, without any double counting. You see fruits from one side, another side from the other side, uh, and you can, you can uh, you essentially can factor, you, you, you want to make sure you don't double count them. Um, so this is, this is very nice. We not only do yield estimation, but we're also able to uh, estimate, um, uh, the, the, uh, get, get complete uh, three-dimensional information. Um, um, and then finally, I think uh, the last application I do want to mention, and really don't have time to talk about this, is so we work with a nonprofit. Uh, I'm on the board of this foundation, We Robotics, just an amazing group of people. It's really about empowering local communities. They work in Central Africa, Central, Central America, uh, the Peruvian Amazon, um, and just this very simple problem of getting, uh, doing the last mile delivery, which is a big problem in, in, in these countries, um, just having a lot of impact. So for those of you uh, who, uh, and by the way, this is not high tech. This is essentially taking what we already know and bringing it to the locals, uh, which fortunately, again, with the commoditization of technologies is possible. Um, so let me, let me stop here. I had a few more things I wanted to say about uh, technology trends, but I'm going to skip that um, and instead just uh, make a couple of observations. I think in particular the fact that the price to performance ratio of autonomous drones drops and will continue to drop. Um, I think there's a democratization of technology, which is all good for us. There's a huge opportunity for impact, not just in the commercial side, but also on the social side. And we all think about drones, and uh, of course the big temp tech companies are forever telling us, well, the government's not doing enough to enable these drones to fly freely. With well, lots and lots of areas where I guarantee you, you can fly. By the way, the FAA doesn't have any jurisdiction in mines, for example, but you can go in farms, you can go in forests, uh, and there are people who welcome you with open arms, and you can really have an impact. So uh, finally, I just want to conclude the lots of unsung heroes here, uh, my, my students, collaborators who make all of this possible. Um, I just want to thank them. So thank you very much. Happy to take questions if there are yeah. questions. And I really appreciate all of you coming at 8.30 in the morning. So uh, we have uh, the microphones in the center. So if any of you have questions, uh, please just come by those microphones. And then uh, I can ask you to uh, ask a question. Yes, Yanis. Hi, Vijay. Thanks for a very nice talk. A couple of questions that comes to mind. One of them is uh, quadrotors in general have the very short time of flight. You can do an experiment and then switch the batteries, then start an experiment and, oh, no, something went wrong. Uh, we all know that. Uh, <clears throat> do you have any predictions about battery and uh, life on the drones beyond the famous 20 minutes. And the second one is, as quadrotors move in, uh, in, in an almost omnidirectional way, uh, how do you deal with uh, sensors? Do you s slap cameras all over, or w what's your thoughts on that? 
great, great questions. Um, I, I did want to talk about uh, the power issue. Um, so, so these are. So, if you look in this chart, uh, this is all. all uh, so, this is actually work done with uh, a colleague at uh, ARL. Um, bunch of batteries tested. Uh, specific power on the left side, on the on the y-axis. Specific energy on the x-axis. Nothing has changed a whole lot in the last five years. Um, and despite uh, what Penn alum Elon Musk will tell you, nothing has changed with batteries. There is no new, nothing new coming down the pipeline. Um, I think we're basically stuck with these numbers. And it's sad because the little picture on the right side that I show you, that's a, that's a picture of, uh, of fat, fat, tissue that we all carry, some of us more than others. Um, and that is 50 times more efficient than our batteries. So we're really good at storing things, not so good at getting rid of it. But uh, uh, the other thing that's really tragic is um, how inefficient our quadrotors are. We, we burn about 200 watts per kilo. So Usain Bolt, and this is the most inefficient man, I believe, I'd, I'd love to you to challenge me. When he does a 10 meter dash, he's burning roughly 20 watts per kilo. We are 10 times more inefficient than the fastest man on earth. That's a problem. Nothing is gonna change about this picture or the observations I've made. So the only thing you can really focus on is the weight and make and bring down the weight. But bring down the weight, you increase uh, the amount of uh, the, the mission life. And that, that's the only solution that I see, at least in the next five years. Um, the second question you mentioned is really about the idea that as roboticists, we're used to taking a platform that works, slapping stuff on top, and in fact, we're as far away from the iPhone as possible, right? This is a code, hardware software co design system. So the question perhaps you're asking is, when is it that all of this will mature to a point that actually things will be co-designed? And I think this is happening already, mostly in Shenzhen, uh, where uh, low-cost LiDARs are being integrated into platforms. So I think we will see that next generation of platforms where things are truly uh, integrated. And I know there are people from Amazon here that are talking about $200 LiDARs. So I, I do think this is going to happen in the near future, given the, the, the tremendous potential of this technology. You have a question there? Uh, Vijay, excellent talk. Thank you for that. Uh, you hinted at some of the concerns in the interplay between industry and academia. Uh, can you elaborate a little more on how you would see uh, industry, academia, and government playing better as an ecosystem for robotics? I mean, gosh, that's a one hour, I need a one hour response to that. I, don't, uh, I think this is a serious, um, uh, this is a serious challenge. Uh, uh, but keep in mind that 15 years ago, we were complaining that industry was not interested in robotics. So we should actually be grateful that we are in a field that industry sees as being relevant to their future. So that's, that's the good thing. I think the, the bad thing is um, we're not doing a very good job of investing in our future. Uh, ultimately, I think our future lies in educating and training the next generation of leaders. And the question I ask is how can we be more effective doing this as a group? Um, so our interactions with the industry today are a lot more one-sided than I would like it to be. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't want to get into a debate here, but, but this is a very important question uh, that I think we need to address going forward. I have a question here. Uh, good morning, Professor Koma. Uh, thank you for the fantastic talk. Um, my question is that in robotic area, most of us are working on complete and intelligent robotic system. Usually we can divide into the hardware design, robotic control, and navigation. The three areas require different team backgrounds and the cost is different. For example, for the hardware, we may need a long time for the manufacturing. For the navigation, we may need a good math background. Uh, how, what do you think we can do to make um, a better cooperation between the three teams to make sure a synchronized progress for the complete robotic system. 
I think this is a great question. All I'll say is it was a lot worse about 10 years ago. Um, I think uh, given that there's so much information that's out there, I think this, uh, this drive towards open source software has, has spilled over into open source hardware. And the barrier to entry to different areas in robotics has been coming down. So uh, I would argue the trend is in the right direction. Uh, if, uh, you know, and I gotta be careful how I say this because my colleagues at Penn want to start a, a robotics department. Um, and I think the right way to do this is not think in terms of disciplines as electrical engineering, computer science, or mechanical engineering, but actually start training this new breed of engineers that will actually think um, flexibly across these areas. And then the one piece you haven't mentioned is really uh, the piece that I struggle with a lot, which is how do you get uh, humans uh, to use uh, the equipment and interact with the hardware and software. Um, use is not the right word, but uh, essentially think about humans as, as collaborators with robots. I think that needs to be part of the equation too, which, with further, which further exacerbates the problem that you've just uh, raised. But I think this is an important point and something that we do need to address. Um, I think the trends are in the right direction, but I think we need to address the human interaction piece um, uh, more, more in a more formal way. Thank you. So we'll have our last question here. Thank you for, for your talk, Professor Kumar. Um, my question is maybe a little bit soft. Uh, you talked about developing or, or educating the, the future leaders, the engineers who will be leaders in the community. And um, you talked about the technical side of that, but you mentioned there's social changes that are, that are associated. We're moving very quickly technologically. Are we doing enough to, in, in your opinion, are we doing enough to train future leaders in the social aspects of their work? Uh, no, <laughs> that's a quick answer. I don't, I don't think we're doing enough, but um, I'm optimistic on that front uh, because, and you know, I spent uh, time in, in Washington, D.C., um, and uh, one of the hardest challenges I thought I would have is convincing the senators and congressmen why robotics is important. But it turns out their kids do a better job of convincing their parents, the kids of congressmen, because they get it. Right? They go to school, the single most exciting thing they see at school is, is robotics, and they think about ways robots could be used at home. And so I never had to do that sales job. That doesn't mean we don't need to educate our congressmen and, and uh, senators, but, but, I, uh, but I think society as a whole is embracing robotics at a faster rate than I thought. Having said that, I think there is a big question of what the digital divide is. Uh, it used to be about ac accessing the internet. It used to be about using the personal computer. Now, really, it is about fundamentally understanding the technology and how that technology can interact with you in your professional life and in your, in, in your life at home. I think that uh, th there is still a significant divide. And again, I'll just mention the work that we Robotics is doing, which is taking the technology to people who have never, ever driven a car before, and now they are learning how to operate drones. Uh, so to me, that's remarkable. So I think more efforts like that uh, are required for, for impact. Thank you.